All right, so chapter 18 is all about regulating how genes are expressed. Conducting the genetic orchestra, prokaryotes and eukaryotes will determine what genes get expressed and um, how often they should be expressed based on their environment. Um, when we are dealing with multicellular eukaryotes, um, this expression of genes is going to be critical for development and helps to um, better understand why we have differences in types of cells. Um, RNA molecules are definitely a key part of the gene expression in terms of going from transcription to translation, but they also play some other um, pretty important roles as well in eukaryotic cells. So we're going to start by focusing on prokaryotes, and that's going to be um, in the form of bacteria. Um, they are able to respond to environmental changes um, by regulating the process of transcription. Um, natural selection favors bacteria that produce products that they can make in their cell, and cells can regulate um, the amount of enzymes that are produced um, through feedback, which we talked about previously, as well as through gene regulation. Um, when genes are being expressed in bacteria, they are controlled by what we call operons. Um, so this is just kind of an overview of how um, a particular um, pro product that is made can inhibit um, additional amounts of that, in this case, amino acid being made. Um, and it can also in have an impact on what genes are going to get transcribed, which would result in making some of those proteins. So operons basically are a group of genes that are functionally related, and they are coordinated together by a single on-off switch. Um, that switch is located within the promoter region. It's a segment of DNA there. Um, and the operon as a whole contains that operator segment as well as the promoter and the genes that are under um, control of that promoter. So operons can be switched off using a protein repressor. And when that repressor is bound to the DNA, it prevents gene transcription by um, preventing RNA polymerase from binding. Um, to, um, so that it won't be able to transcribe your DNA. There's a separate gene, a regulatory gene, that that repressor protein is made from, and it can be made both in an active and an inactive form. Uh, it really depends on other things that are present. Co-repressors are able to um, interact with repressor proteins and can facilitate turning um, an operon off. So there's your promoter. RNA polymerase has to move through that operator region to be able to transcribe the genes on the DNA. And so if that operator has been blocked off um, by the repressor, the RNA polymerase isn't going to be able to go any further and those genes aren't going to be able to be transcribed. Okay, so if you have an inactive repressor, it will not be able to bind to that operator properly and as a result the genes will be expressed but if you have a co-repressor um, it can change the shape of that inactive repressor and that will prevent those genes from being expressed so we're going to talk about two types of operons both repressible and inducible repressible operons are ones that typically stay on and so when the repressor binds to the operon, it's shutting off that process from occurring. Um, the trip operon is one of these. Um, this is a way E. coli can synthesize the amino acid tryptophan. And so the trip operon um, stays on. And when it is staying on, it's because the, the cells need that amino acid. And the genes that are involved in the synthesis of tryptophan continue to be transcribed. Tryptophan, however, if it is present in sufficient amounts, can bind to that repressor protein, changing its shape, um, and that will allow it um, to turn off your operon. Um, so the repressor is only able to be active if the co-repressor is present. If you have sufficiently high levels of tryptophan, you will shut this operon down.
So again, repressibles are ones that are on when your repressor has a co-repressor bound to it. It can bind to the DNA um, at the operator and shut off transcription. So there you can see the regulatory gene, the promoter right before it, that makes the inactive form of the repressor protein. Um, and so as long as it's inactive, um, transcription is able to occur. Um, when the tryptophan is present in sufficient amounts, it can change your shape, making that repressor become active, allowing it to bind to that operator, and transcription no longer continues. The other type of operon we're going to talk about are ones that are typically turned off, inducible operons. And then there are molecules that can inactivate your repressor, um, known as inducers, and they help to turn on transcription. LAC operon is one of these inducible operons. It contains um, DNA that codes for um, genes that will produce enzymes. Um, and those enzymes are needed to both hydrolyze as well as metabolize that lactose. Um, so in general, if there's not lactose present, you don't need this operon on. So by default, the LAC repressor, once it has been formed, is able to bind and turn off the LAC operon. Um, inducers are going to inactivate this repressor and allow the LAC operon to start to work and be transcribed to make these enzymes. So there's your um, repressor protein bound to your operator um, in this inducible operon, so keeping the operon turned off. Um, but when the inducer binds to that repressor and changes its shape, it prevents that repressor from being bound to the operator, and those genes get to be expressed. So LAC-I is the regulatory gene that makes this protein, and lactose is going to be um, what determines whether this stays on or stays off. Um, so in the case of having that active repressor, if you don't have lactose um, available, the repressor is going to stay in its active form and you're not going to have the enzymes being generated. When you do have lactose present, a form of lactose, allolactose, is able to act as an inducer. It binds to that repressor protein, changing its shape, and that will allow the RNA polymerase, once it has been set, the repressor has been set free from your operator to move through the operon and transcribe the enzymes, um, the DNA for the enzymes that are needed to process lactose. So inducible enzymes typically are going to function in catabolic pathways when you're trying to break something down and some sort of chemical signal, as we saw with the allolactose, is going to help to remove that repressor and allow those genes to be transcribed. Repressible enzymes we typically see in anabolic pathways. When you're building things, um, you need large amounts or high amounts of those products to be able to shut down these operons. You need enough of the co-repressor to bind to the repressor to allow it, the inactive repressor, to allow it to shut that particular pathway down. Um, so these are both considered to be negative control because the operons are switched off when the act re repressor is in its active form, um, but we've seen how they can go on and off depending on what's present. So you can also have these operons um, be subject to positive control. Um, and one example of that is catabolite activator protein, or CAP. It's a transcription activator. And so Glucose is something that E. coli prefer for nutrition, and so when there are when there's little glucose available, um, there's going to be a lot of CAMP available, and so you can use the CAMP to activate CAP. Um, activated CAP will attach to the lac operon promoter, and when it attaches to there, it helps to get RNA polymerase in place. It increases its affinity. And so if RNA polymerase is more attached to that operon, it's going to transcribe more of those genes. And so 
Why would that be important? Well, when you are breaking down lactose, you're breaking it down into simpler sugars, which would include glucose. So by increasing the enzymes that are needed to digest lactose, you're going to help to elevate your glucose levels. And when those levels reach a certain point, CAP will detach from the operon, and you won't have transcription occurring in super fast mode any longer. Um, this is also used in other operons that work through the process of breaking materials down in cat catabolic pathways. So there you can see your CAP binding site, part of the promoter. Um, when CAMP is available, it activates it, and that helps RNA polymerase to bind and go to work on those enzymes uh, more expeditiously. That's only going to happen when your glucose levels are quite low. Um, when your glucose levels are more of what are typical in those cells, CAP is no longer activated, the CAMP is not available, and the operator returns to its normal, or the operon returns to its normal level of function. Um, so as long as you've got the glucose, you would see this operon turned off. So that's prokaryotic regulation. Now we're going to spend um, some time on eukaryotic gene expression. Um, with eukaryotes, um, there are lots of opportunities for the gene expression to be regulated. Um, and it is a key factor in terms of cells that need to perform certain functions, um, especially when they are part of tissues, and again, those tissues making up organs. Um, because as you start, all of your cells have the same DNA, um, but the cells will end up only working in certain types of tissues based on what genes are expressed. Um, so when genes are not expressed properly, you can end up um, dealing with various disorders, some of which with those would be cancer. So we can have regulation in the nucleus by modifying our chromatin. Um, we have modifications that take place after transcription has occurred um, through RNA processing. And then we have modifications that occur outside of the nucleus. Um, we have the breaking down of mRNA so that proteins do not continue to be made by ribosomes. We have processing take place with um, the proteins once they have been made. Um, and then we have um, tags put on them to help to get them from their location on the ribosome to their intended target. So we're going to start by talking about chromatin structure, and we talked a little bit about this in Chapter 16. Um, genes with, that have highly packed heterochromatin are typically not expressed. Those are the ones that are more heavily methylated. Um, and so chemical modifications can influence um, the chromatin structure and whether or not genes are able to be expressed when you have your chromatin so tightly packed. Um, so one way to help to promote transcription is to add acetyl groups. In histone acetylation, um, these acetyl groups are added to positively charged lysines in the histone tails, and that's going to help to unwind that DNA um, from around the histones, and that's going to make it more available for transcription to occur. We've talked about how methylation previously is able to condense your chromatin, um, so that's going to help to um, minimize its ability to be transcribed. Um, phosphorylation next to these methylated amino acids can also help to loosen chromatin to make it more available for transcription. So the histone code hypothesis proposes that the combination of modifications as well as the order in which they occur helps to determine the form we find our chromatin in and the um, ability of it to be transcribed. So you've got your histone tails. Again, the double helix is wrapped around the histones, and then those histones get wrapped together to make the nucleosomes. Um, some of the histone tails are going to protrude from your nucleosome. If they are acylated, um, those chromatin um, pieces that are loose stick out, which makes it easier for them to be transcribed. 
and I should have said acetylated, I'm sorry. The unacetylated ones you can see are wrapped more closely to one another. They are not as available for transcription. So methylation, um, again, when methyl groups get added to certain bases, um, this is associated with reduced transcription. Um, this can cause genes to be inactivated for extended periods of time. Um, and genomic imprinting um, is heavily affected by methylation. Um, the methylation will regulate whether the maternal or the paternal alleles of certain genes are going to be expressed when development is beginning. Um, these modifications we talked about, the acetylation, the methylation, the phosphorylation, they don't alter the DNA sequence, but they do have the ability to be passed on to future generations. Um, so this um, get, um, inheritance of traits, um, not directly influenced by the sequence of DNA, is known as epigenetic inheritance. So depending on whether you have your chromatin um, methylated, whether you have your chromatin um, acetylated, whether you have the chromatin adjacent to methylated um, DNA, um, phosphorylated, those are all going to have an impact on which traits get passed on to future offspring. And so whether they get passed on or not is not based on the alleles, but whether they are available to go through that transcription process. If they're not able to be transcribed, you would not observe those physical characteristics in offspring. So transcription initiation can be regulated um, by making those DNA regions more or less available to transcription. So we also have these control elements, um, these non-coding sequences of DNA um, that are located upstream of the transcription start point. Um, and they provide places for transcription factors to bind. And those transcription factors are going to play a key role in determining what genes get expressed in which types of cells. You can have control elements that are located close to your promoter, known as proximal control elements. And you can have distal control elements, ones that are located further away. These might even be found in introns. And so these transcription factors need to be in place for RNA polymerase to be able to get transcription started. So there you can kind of see a DNA stream. You've got your promoter region, you've got those control elements, and then you've got the start point where the DNA gets transcribed and you get your introns and your exons until you reach a point where you have that poly A signal and you have transcription stop. At that point, you can have processing occur and you can have the five prime cap and the poly A tail added on um, so that you are ready to take this mature RNA and take it out of the nucleus and to a ribosome to be translated. So there are transcription factors that are going to be needed in general for protein coding genes, um, but which control elements are present are going to play a role on the amount of transcription of specific genes, basically how those control elements are able to interact with those specific transcription factors. So an activator is a protein that binds to an enhancer and will help to um, further along um, gene transcription. They have domains that bind to the DNA and will help to activate transcription. Um, they will cause a sequence of protein-protein interactions to occur, and you also can have transcription factors act as repressors, inhibiting particular genes from being expressed. Um, these activators and repressors can act but indirectly by influencing the chromatin structure, which would then either promote or silence transcription. So there you can kind of see your activators and you have your distal control element, and then you have them working together as a unit, so now they're acting as enha enhancers. You've got a protein that's helping to allow the DNA to bend. You've got some mediator proteins, and you've got some transcription factors. And all of those can work in concert together to help get the DNA ready to bind RNA polymerase to and begin transcription. 
So as opposed to the prokaryotic operon, eukaryotic genes that are needing to be expressed simultaneously um, that are involved in a certain process that you need um, multiple different proteins present. They each have their own promoter. They each have their own control elements, and they can be on very different chromosomes. But regardless of what chromosomes they're on um, and regardless of what their promoter is, they typically will have the same combination of those control elements. So as long as those control elements are present, um, the activators um, will recognize them and help to get transcription occurring simultaneously of these related genes. So the chromatin loops um, from your individual chromosomes are actually found in general locations or specific locations, that should be more clear, in the nucleus. And there are definitely times when loops from different chromosomes will be found in specific locations. Um, those locations often have lots of transcription factors and lots of RNA polymerase. Um, and there's thought that the, there may be a reason all this is happening at one point, that those chromosomes all contain sequences of DNA um, that are able to code for proteins that are going to have a common function. So we've talked about what happens before transcription occurs. Now we're going to talk about ways we can regulate transcription after it's had taken place. Um, and so these just kind of help to fine tune it um, based on what's happening in around um, the nucleus or around that RNA at the time. So we can have splicing occur where we have different mRNA molecules produced from your same primary transcript. Basically, you get different combinations of exons together, and sometimes it could be that an intron gets treated as an exon, or an exon gets treated as an intron. So there you see the troponin T gene, and you've got your exons labeled, and you see different combinations coming together to make the mature mRNA. Um, if the mRNA is just allowed to live outside in the cytoplasm, then ribosomes are going to keep coming to it and producing proteins. Um, although we don't want the mRNA to disappear until we're ready to make it disappear, um, we definitely don't want it lasting indefinitely. Um, so there are sequences that are a part of the mRNA in eukaryotic cells that are part at the end of the three prime um, end of your molecule um, that help to determine how long that mRNA should live for um, before it starts to be degraded out in the cytoplasm. Translation, um, getting translation started um, can um, be impacted by regulatory proteins that bind to that mRNA so that they prevent it from being translated. Um, or you could have mRNAs that have been made um, on several different chromosomes and are all ready to be translated um, have them occur simultaneously. Um, so that would be important um, with fertilization after an egg has been fertilized and you need to get growth factors ready to go so it can go through its series of cell divisions. You would want to have all the enzymes that are needed for those processes to be available at once. Once translation has taken place, um, you can have cleavage occur, you could have other processing activities take place, chemical groups added, um, you can have um, tags added to it to help to direct it to its location, um, but there are going to be times when you no longer need a particular protein to be present, and so proteasomes are these protein complexes um, that are able to take proteins that have been tagged with ubiquitone, um, ubiquitin, um, it, when you are tagged with that as a protein, that is a sign that it is time for you to be recycled. And so um, once the protein with that ubiquitin tag enters the proteasome, it starts to be broken apart. And so that you get back the individual peptides, the individual amino acids that then can be used in other proteins. So non-coding RNAs can play several roles in impacting on gene expression. There's a lot of DNA present in our chromosomes, but not 
um, all of it, very, very small amount of it actually codes for proteins. And only a small portion of the DNA that does not code um, for proteins is all going to be able to code um, for RNA, like rRNAs and tRNAs. Um, but there is a lot of our genome that actually gets transcribed into non-coding RNAs. Um, these non-coding RNAs can have a big impact on your mRNA translation as well as your chromatin configuration. So I talked about this one briefly in class with microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. MicroRNAs are small single-stranded RNA molecules and they actually can bind to your mRNA and they basically are acting as the cell's cops. If they think that this RNA is foreign, that it should not be translated, that those proteins should not be made, it can block that from happening and it can actually start to degrade those mRNAs. Um, so it can prevent the transcribed mRNA from being translated, and that phenomenon is known as RNA interference. Um, this is caused by the small interfering RNAs, and these two are similar to one another, um, but they come from different um, RNA molecules to begin with. So there's an miRNA. Um, it will hydrogen bond to make those hairpins. The dicer protein um, will come along and break it into smaller chunks. And now they will work in concert to recognize mRNAs that seem foreign to the cell, and they will prevent them from being translated or they will break them down altogether. So I said it also is going to have an impact on chromatin um, and as a result transcription. We're going to see this with yeast. SIRNAs can play a big role in, whether, in the heterochromatin formation and prevent um, chromosomes from being able to go through gene expression. Um, these small NCRNAs, um, known as PWE associated RNAs, PI RNAs, um, are able to produce more heterochromatin. And so the heterochromatin then cannot be transcribed. So it prevents DNA elements that are a part of the genome, um, known as transposon. These yeasts are able to take on new pieces of DNA. And so it prevents those new pieces of DNA from producing their proteins. So these non-coding RNAs can affect gene expression in multiple locations throughout this process of replication, transcription, and translation. Um, the number of these miRNAs um, may have had an influence on the complexity um, of organisms over time. Um, it's thought perhaps that siRNAs evolved first, then your miRNAs, and then further on your PI RNAs. Sorry, I went too far. And so gene expression is going to have a key role in embryonic development, how cells are able to be organized within an organism. Um, a fertilized egg has to be able to give rise through embryonic, during embryonic development to lots of different types of cells, which then get grouped in tissues and then organs and then organ systems and then make up the whole organism together. Um, so for that to happen, um, we need lots of cell division to occur. We need cells to go through a differentiation process and we also need morphogenesis to occur. So differentiation is when cells basically start to only be able to take on certain functions. They are going to be found in specific types of structures. Morphogenesis is the physical processes that take place that help an organism to take on its shape. Um, differential gene expression is going to occur because these genes are going to be regulated differently depending on what type of cell is present. Um, and there are materials already present in the egg that can help facilitate this gene regulation while cell division is occurring. So those are found in the cytoplasm of that egg because the cytoplasm has RNAs and proteins and 
other nutrients that the fertilized egg um, is going to be a need to be able to grow. Um, those are maternal substances that are going to influence early development. And that's going to play a role as to how genes get expressed in those different types of cells. So again, initially, um, before the egg is fertilized, you just have the maternal um, cytoplasm components. Um, once the sperm has fertilized the egg, you still just have those maternal um, cytoplasmic determinants. But as division occurs, you will have different amounts of those cytoplasmic determinants and different types of cytoplasmic determinants in your multi-celled embryo. So another source that's going to play a role are environmental signals, and those signals could just come from adjacent embryonic cells. Um, so those signal molecules can influence transcription in nearby cells. And so that can also help to um, help with differentiation of the different smell types that are needed for that organism. So there you have your signal transduction pathway going to work. And molecules are being released by an adjacent cell that get traveled to the nearby cell and then influence the nucleus as to what genes get expressed. So determination is when a cell um, has been committed to a certain type of tissue or has a certain type of function. Um, determination is going to occur before differentiation. So determination tells you what type of cell you're going to end up being. Differentiation is the actual outcome of that event. Um, when you start producing proteins that are specifically needed by certain types of tissues. So the example here is myoblast. Um, they are able to produce protein specific to muscles, and then they end up forming skeletal muscle cells. MyoD is um, a very important master regulatory gene um, that is going to commit that cell to becoming a skeletal muscle cell. Um, that protein is a transcription factor, and we talked about this earlier, that can bind to enhancers of target genes that are needed in those muscle cells. So there you can kind of see that process occurring. Pattern formation is getting things set up spatially. Um, you wanna set up your axes initially um, so that that is ready to go. And then positional information is having um, cues that tell the cell where it should be at relative to those axes as well as to its neighboring cells. Um, this has been explored a lot in the fruit fly. And so when we take in research um, in, that encompasses anatomical, genetic, and biochemical approaches, um, we were able to see through the fruit fly that there were developmental principles similar in other species, including us. So here you have your Drosophila, and there are, again, those cytoplasmic determinants that, and the unfertilized egg that determine where your axes are going to be and then where the different um, segments are going to be in um, the adult fruit fly. So there you have your head, your thorax, and your abdomen. Um, lined up along those body axes. And so you have your egg um, that is, first you have just the egg growing um, within an ovarian follicle. So the nurse cell just helps provide it with the materials it needs to grow. Once you have an unfertilized egg, but a mature unfertilized egg, those nursing cells have been diminished and that egg is ready to be fertilized. Once that egg does get fertilized, um, your cells start to go through that rapid cell division using the cytoplasmic determinants that were present um, to set up your body segments in this um, fruit fly, eventually turning it into a larva. Um, homeotic genes are going to play um, a key role in that pattern formation. Lewis discovered that. Um, Lewis Nilsen Bullhard, probably didn't say that right, and Bischaus won a Nobel Prize in 1995 for determining this. 
um, the latter two um, looked at segment formation. They looked, formed mutants and tried to identify genes based on breeding experiments to figure out um, what genes were controlling um, the segment formation. Um, many of the mutations that they formed um, led to embryonic lethals. Um, in other words, these um, the organisms that had those mutations were not able to survive. And they found a whopping 120 genes were essential um, to that actual segmentation process. So there's your wild type fruit fly. Um, and then there is your one, one of their mutant fruit flies. So maternal effect genes are going to encode for those cytoplasmic determinants that help to determine the axes of the fruit fly's body. Um, they're known as egg polarity genes because they control which um, way the egg is oriented and that will influence the way the fly gets oriented. One of these, the bicoid gene, affects the front half. If the mother had no functional bicoid gene, the embryo will not have the front half of its body and will have duplicate posterior structures at both ends. Um, so with that in mind, um, it's thought that the product of that mother's bicoid gene is going to be concentrated at the anterior end since that was the end that was gone. Um, this is just one example of the morphogen gradient hypothesis in which there are morphogens that determine the embryo's axes and some other features. So there's your wild type and there's your mutant. And there's the bicoid mRNA. So just looking at where its location is at um, and then where it is found in that earlier and early on in the embryo. Um, so by identifying this protein, it helps us better understand the mother's role in the embryo development and that molecule gradients can play a key role in the polarity and embryonic position. And so the final section we're going to talk about, um, we already did a little bit of this earlier um, when we talked about mitosis, is um, how cancer um, can result from genetic changes that are going to impact on the control of the cell cycle. Um, we've been talking a lot about gene regulation, and gene regulation, when that is not working correctly, when it goes amok, um, is what is going to have a key role with cancer growing. Um, cancer be can be caused to um, genes that are involved with regulating cell growth and division. Um, oncogenes are your cancer-causing genes. Proto-oncogenes are the normal cellular genes that would be under control from gene expression um, for normal cell growth and division. When one of those proto-oncogenes gets turned into an oncogene, that's how those oncogenes get formed, um, the cell cycle can be stimulated to go through division more rapidly than it is intended. Um, so ways that that could happen you could put a new promoter on, which could cause that gene to be transcribed more readily. Multiple copies of it could be made, or there could be a point mutation, which could cause um, lots of that particular protein to be generated. Um, or you could have a mutation within your gene. So the point mutation first is within the control element. So the gene itself is fine, but maybe having that mutation allows that RNA polymerase to bind more often which is going to cause it to go kind of on speed and be able to produce lots of that protein. Or if you have a mutation within the gene itself, it might help to make that gene more um, capable of withstanding um, being broken down. We talked about mRNA degradation, um, um, allow it to be translated more often, more frequently, and not have that three prime UTR region that kind of gives you an idea of the lifespan of that mRNA. So there's just says converting proto-oncogenes to oncogenes. Probably should have put that slide, this slide before the previous one. We just talked about all that. And then we also talked earlier on this year about tumor suppressor genes and that they are able to help to prevent cell growth from getting out of control. If these genes have mutations in them, um, they are not going to be able to help prevent that. And that too could lead to um, cancer um, getting going. 
Um, the suppressor proteins are able to help repair damaged DNA, uh, prevent cells from adhering to one another, and inhibit the cell cycle um, during cell signaling so that it doesn't constantly keep being signaled to go through whatever metabolic processes um, the cell has would normally go through through that pathway. So um, mutations in the RAS proto-oncogene and the P53 tumor suppressor genes are pretty common in human cancers. Um, the RAS gene, um, if there are mutations in it, it can lead to a hyperactive RAS protein. Um, so that's going to cause additional cell division to take place. If the P53 gene has mutations, it's going to prevent ceasing the cell cycle um, when it should not be allowed to continue on. Um, so cell cycle suppression is one way um, that we can limit damage of um, DNA um, to be passed on to additional cells. So P53 is able to prevent those mutations from being carried forward. If P53 is not working properly, then those mutated DNA, um, chrom the mutated DNA strands will be passed on to additional cells, which will then be able to do all of what that mutated DNA was doing in the original cell. So there's your RAS protein. Basically, it is going to um, make that protein, um, that pathway continue, um, producing that transcription factor to continue that gene expression. It doesn't ever shut it down. Um, P53, if it is not working properly, um, will not be able to stop the cell cycle from occurring. It will not be able to prevent um, the cell from going through mitosis. And both of those, whether you have too much of one protein or if you have, in, in terms of a proto-oncogene, or if you have two, um, you don't have any of that tumor suppressor gene or very small amounts of that tumor suppressor gene would result in increased cell division. You need lots of mutations to truly end up with full-fledged cancer. Um, so that's why you typically are going to see individuals um, impacted by cancer um, at, with increasing age. Um, a cancerous cell, if we look at it from the DNA perspective, typically has at least one proto-oncogene has been converted to an oncogene and a mutation of multiple tumor suppressor genes. So there are checks and balances in place and so here with colon cancer, there's your normal cells. Um, if you lose um, one of your tumor suppressor genes, a polyp can start to form. Um, if the RAS oncogene um, gets going out of control and you lose another tumor suppressor gene, um, then that growth can get a little bit bigger. If you lose yet another tumor suppressor gene or have additional mutations, it can start to invade um, those cells, and now you would have a tumor. There are other factors that can play a role as to whether um, you are more likely um, to develop cancer. There are obviously um, mutations in alleles um, that can be passed on from parents to offspring. Um, and those, so you can have genetic um, Re, um, genetic sources that will lead to genetic mutations that will lead to cancer, um, but we can also have environmental factors as well. And so right there is just reviewing some of those different modifications that we talked about that can occur. Again, we're focusing more on eukaryotic cells, um, but the different modifications that can influence which genes get expressed.